Hey everyone, welcome back to Secret Sonics. This is episode 88 with Matt Leffler Shulman. Uh, Matt and I had a great conversation. We talked about the importance of slow growth. We talked about, you know, quitting his government job, moving out of DC, starting a studio. We talked about his, you know, transition into mastering, his approach to mastering, and we even got nerdy about our favorite microphones and recording and stuff like that. So with all that to say, here's my conversation with Matt Leffler Shulman here on Secret Sonics. <laughs> You're listening to Secret Sonics, a podcast exploring the creative side of music production. Join us weekly for honest conversations with real-world music producers and audio professionals. And welcome back to Secret Sonics. I am your host, Ben Wallach. My guest today is Matt Leffler Shulman. Matt is a Baltimore based mastering engineer and occasional mixing engineer. Having been in the music industry for 25 years, Matt has had the privilege of working with an eclectic range of artists from all over the world, from Maine to Spain to the Ukraine. He has multiple top 10 charting songs on Billboard, has worked with Grammy award-winning artists, and has had songs with multi-million spins on Spotify. Matt and I connected on Instagram after he heard my episode with Katie Tavini, uh, and I invited him to join me on the show, which he has graciously agreed to do. So with all that to say, welcome to Secret Sonics, Matt. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Of course. So tell the audience a little bit about your story. Who are you? And uh, I guess, how did music start for you? And I guess, how did that evolve into music production? Wow, that, that's a heavy question. So... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, so we do, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. Start with the heavy. So I'm a mastering engineer here in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, in the States. And how I got started into music? Well, I mean, it goes back to when I was a, a wee lad and, you know, my dad would play records. He'd play, you know, Aretha Franklin and Stones and the Beatles and Joni Mitchell and Sly Stone and just, you know, all the classic records that everybody loves. And then I remember one day he brought home this cassette player. Um, of course, everything I was listening to was on vinyl and it, at, at an early age. He taught me, you know, the stylus and like how to put the record on and then flip it. Um, mm -hmm. So for a very early age, I was very into the whole the whole process of listening to a record. And then he brought home a tape machine, a cassette tape machine. And in retrospect, I think my mind was blown and it was a game changer for me. But at the time, I was just this is a really at the time I was thinking it was just a very cool machine that I could listen to Casey Kasem's top 20 or whatever, top 40 on Sunday and record songs and then listen to them whenever I wanted to later. And for me, that was just huge. It was totally huge. Yeah. And every morning I would get up or not every morning, every Sunday I would get up and, you know, listen to that, that, you know, top 40 countdown. And I was there on the pause button ready to unpause it and, you know, capture that song that I wanted to hear. Um, and I remember making these, you know, I think it was yearly mixtapes. And I think I started that in 86. And it probably went until like the early 90s, I think. I don't know. <laughs> it's been a nice. long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So and then from that, in terms of how it got technical, I do remember that on the tape machine, and, and this is just like, and I don't think I've ever told this story before, but I remember on the tape machine, there was a button on there that was CRO2 and normal. And there were like different types of cassettes you could use and it would change the bias of the record head mm. or the playhead depending on the formulation of the tape. And I probably didn't really fully understand any of what it meant, but it was fascinating to me. And I think that was like – that was that initial spark of curiosity that probably led me down the road of, hey – this is interesting. This changes the sound. Maybe I should be an audio engineer. So cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm a little younger than you, but uh, as I said, I was born in the 80s. But yeah, even I remember those tape, you know, just recording to those little cassette tapes was such a was such an awesome way to just, you know, capture your favorite song and listen to it whenever you wanted to. Absolutely. So and and making totally mixtapes with, with friends and passing them around. And there was a whole bootleg era of people trading cassette tapes of live shows. It, it was a, it was a cool medium, I I thought. And strangely, it's it's come back in style, too. Yeah, totally has. Yeah, that, I, I don't know if CDs are ever going to come back, but 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 it makes sense that tape come. I think anything tangible, anything that has like that extra, I don't know, layer to it 
you know? CDs, wants to- yeah, you know, the funny thing is, is in the 90s, there was this format called the ADAT. And I right. think a lot of people had a love-hate relationship with it, probably more hate, just because the syncing was always terrible and the conversion wasn't great. But I still make the joke that in 20 years, Waves or Isotope is going to come out with a plugin that's like, it's going to call like, <laughs> it'd be called the ADAT plugin. And it'll be that, you know, 16-bit conversion that you know we all know and love right and it'll it'll sound like an alanis morissette i know, you know? exactly right right, right, right. <laughs> yeah you know your history <laughs> a little bit i yeah. remember reading about the the guy that recorded the alanis morissette's record uh what was it jagged little pill yeah doing it on adat machines i remember i don't remember which book it was that i read that in but <laughs> i think it was one of bobby osinski's book there, oh yeah that's a great book yeah there's there's a a strange a strangely large amount of records that were recorded with adats I'm sure. Yeah. Wait, so let's go back to you. So what happens after you have this tape machine, you're passing around these mixtapes. Yes. Um, how, how do you turn this into a career? Oh, so then high school happens. I'm in a band. The bassist in my band has a four track. And I guess I'm the person who gravitates towards it. And I sort of figure out how to use it. And I guess by the end of high school, I was like, oh, there's you can make this into a career if you want to and i went to school initially for music performance and then long long story short i ended up getting a degree in nashville in music production and music business um and that that was sort of like i don't know it wasn't like my door to it but it was like the i got the the piece of paper that said i could do it i'd worked with all these amazing consoles worked with these great bands and also knew the business behind it, which I think was completely invaluable information. And, and I feel like a lot of the times with anybody starting out in a business, having a business education is just it, – it, sometimes it can make it or break it in, in the industry you're in. And wow. being in the music industry, it's pretty cutthroat. And, right. <laughs> you know – Having a business background of just, you know, knowing how to set up an LLC or, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, a corporation or, or how, to, how to run your taxes and get licenses for things like these are oh, yeah. really useful things. So just getting your business in order and, you know, in, in turn could help with longevity of, of your business aside from, you know, being good at what you do as well. Right, right, right. Both are important. Was, it, was there a lesson that you learned, you know, at this institute – uh, what was it, T- Tennessee, right? Yeah, Middle Tennessee um, State University. Was there something like a business lesson that you learned that you, you know really helped you at the beginning that you might not have succeeded otherwise? Well, yeah. One being, and also something that my, my father taught me is uh, getting your ducks in a row, like lining everything mm-hmm. up and not, you know, overthinking it, but making sure, you know, like starting a business, like getting all your licensing correct, making sure you're not in uh, a hellhole of debt. Um like just sort of getting your your shop in order so that you can move forward and then worry about the things that matter music yeah that was it was it was such a great school to go to and in retrospect i feel like i didn't take advantage of the school as much as i probably could have there were so many amazing classes i mean there was a class i took just on concert promotion or um wow. contract really writing cool. like totally fascinating classes um, wow, I would love to learn about that stuff like that. I mean, that sounds like yeah. I mean, they probably have some online classes. I'm sure you could do for continuing education or whatever. Um, there's also probably a ton of books. <laughs> I feel like we always kind of regret not doing more at a time when we had time to do more. Like I don't know. Like I, I, yeah, I sort of regret not spending an extra year in New York um, before totally. I moved to Israel and like you know tried a little bit more to perform in clubs and stuff. You know, it's like. Why didn't I do that when I was in my twenties? You know, what I mean? absolutely. <laughs> like that, could been, that could have been a cool experience, but like, I'm never going to do that now. You know, in there's my thirties, no there's no way. As a parent, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, for, forget about it. <laughs> yeah, no. it's <laughs> but, ridiculous. You know, it is. It, it, your life is what it is. You you make the, diso- the the decisions you make, and and you have to live with them. Absolutely, yeah. No, and I and, 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 I, and I feel them. like I did make yeah. all the right decisions. There's a little a little regret that I didn't study music theory more. I mean, I did, mm-hmm. but I wish I went down that route a little, a little more. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with amazing composers too, so I sponge off those guys, um, and I can learn so much from them. And it's it's amazing to be able to have that, you know, relationship with with people like that. Yeah, absolutely. Was there a moment, you know, throughout all this, you know, getting the degree, starting your business, where you kind of realized, oh, this is actually working, like an aha moment? 
I don't know, because, you know, I have that imposter syndrome that a lot of us <laughs> do. And, you know, maybe I yeah. have that moment and then it, it disappears. And I'm like, am I really doing this? Like, am I doing it right? Um, yeah, <laughs> I totally feel that. So I don't know. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I remember opening the studio and, and I had so prior to opening my studio here in Baltimore 10 or 15 years ago, um, I lived in Washington, D.C., and I was basically recording bands and nights and weekends, and it was very low-key. Um, but the the big thing was, you know, pivoting and switching to doing it full-time was – it was a little nerve-wracking. And But, you know, I remember years ago I did a record with Future Islands, and they were up and coming at that point. And I, and I, was, I was thinking, oh, this is pretty cool. Like, this is a band that's going to make it, and – I get to have them in my studio and do this little record with them. Like, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, there's. I feel like definitely there's certain records, and I don't know if there's any one spot that was sort of a defining moment. I feel like there are lots yeah. of little ones. That, yeah. Hey, I'm doing the right thing. So my um, my wife runs the business side of the business, and so I don't really pay attention to the money. And Nice. Yeah, and it's, it's nice that I can kind of separate myself from that. So I don't really know how we're doing, in really, <laughs> until the end of the year. And she's like, oh, well, you know, we, we did 7% more than last year. And I'm like, oh, awesome. Had no idea. Great. Awesome. Um, that is so cool. Yeah. I wish I could separate those two things, kind of. I feel like just to have the mental space to focus on the creative work yeah. would be such a boon. And you wouldn't be thinking about the dollars and cents of like, really, is this project the one I really want to focus on, work that hard on? Like, you know, taking that out of the equation, I feel like you just do, you bring your your best to the table probably all the time. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, guess it's, that's the goal. Yeah. it's it, <laughs> Luckily, it's less stress for me, but probably more stress for her. So I actually kind of wanted to ask you about that, but maybe we're jumping ahead ahead of the, of the storyline. Sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, <laughs> I guess working with your wife in, in this is, is like, how do, you, how do you make that work? And how did you find a wife that can do all that stuff for you? Um, <laughs> basic, you know, basic Google, questions right? like that. <laughs> basic questions like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So when we started the studio, well, full disclosure, she's a web developer. Um, she's mm. a programmer. Um, that's her, her main gig. And when we started the studio... She was doing that a little more part time and was focusing on like the marketing and the business side of the studio. She was like the the second half of Mobtown. Um and, and she still is to a degree. She's definitely sort of the face of a lot of the things that I do. Um sort of on the web and 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 whatnot. And and I and I consult with her all the time about the direction of my work and the business. Um but you know, she comes from entrepreneurial parents. Um so and my 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 dad owned a shop in in Queens um up until like the 70s or 80s we have history in the Yiddish theater like like huh. this is like cool. our world like I, we don't know any other like i mean we're Jews right like <laughs> we got to do yeah. <laughs> like what we got to do you know <laughs> so make it work yeah totally yeah so i guess it's sort of in our blood and you know my dad never owned his own business but he grew up with a father who had his own business so he always sort of had that drive, I guess, to uh, foster that with me with entrepreneurship. Um, nice, yeah, yeah. So I amazing how we work together. I mean, yeah, I mean, a lot of people always ask how how my wife and I get along so well. Be it that, like, you know, when we were running the studio together, um, we were there all the time together, like what, going into work together, having lunch together, and then like leaving together, and then and then coming home and you know making dinner with the kids together. But wow. you know, I guess when you find someone, you know, and it works, and they're the one, like it's you just don't think about it. It just it is what it is. Yeah, I mean, I think different people have different kinds of marriages. I guess, like yeah, you know, so, some people it's like you know you gotta you have like you know very close, and then you're far away, and then you're close again. And some people are just all the time kind of neck, you know. Uh, t- you know, together. Yeah. Uh, I guess it's just about who you are and, you know, who you marry. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, some people would say we're codependent, which could be true. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. That's probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, it works. It's, yeah. But yeah, th- to, uh, just sort of looking at it from um, further back, we're, it's very rare that we're apart from each other. 
um, which is interesting. Right. <laughs> yeah. So this pandemic life was nothing new for you. No, so. no, 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 not at all. No. Yeah, I mean. That's good. Yeah, we've basically been freelancers for the past 15 15- years. 